Hi, Assalamualaikum everyone. My name is Nurdini Adriana and today, me along with my group mates, who are from the group Regionalist, will be presenting to you a presentation titled, Does the Federal Constitution Incorporate Constitutionalism? The law serves many purposes and among the purposes are to establish rules, maintaining orders, resolving conflicts and to preserve rights and liberties of its people. And the state's administrative, legislative and judicial branches of government as well as, as the fundamental liberties of its people are all governed by a body of legislation known as the constitutional law. And in Malaysia, we have the Federal Constitution of Malaysia and it is the supreme law of Malaysia and it consists of 183 articles in total. And it was first adopted in the year 1957 as the Const Constitution of the Federation of Malaya and was revised in the year 1963 to become the Constitution of Malaysia. Okay, so I explained to you the purposes of law and what law do we use here in Malaysia, the Federal Constitution of Malaysia. But what is constitutionalism? What you are seeing right now on this screen are all the basic principles of constitutionalism. Like the first one, all actions from the government must comply with what is written in the Constitution. Like Malaysia, we have the Federal Constitution of Malaysia. So, all actions from the government of Malaysia must comply with what is written in the Constitution. We must abide by it. And constitutionalism acknowledges the need for governance. And a constitution is often found in many gov modern governments like Malaysia. And political power should be constrained by laws. And the last one, the government to be bound by the law and not, not permitted to use its authority in a willful or arbitrary manner. British constitutional law scholar Stanley D. Smith mentioned that constitutionalism is practiced in a country where the government is genuinely accountable to an entity or organ distinct from itself, where elections are freely held on a wide franchise at frequent intervals, where political groups are free to organize in opposition to the government in office, and where the, there are effective legal guarantees for fundamental civil liberties enforced by an independent judiciary. Now, based on what this myth has defined constitutionalism as, there are two key points two things that we have to highlight which are two clear indicators of constitutionalism which are an efficient democratic parliamentary system and independent judiciary that protects civil liberties based on the principles of constitutionalism as i've mentioned earlier and also what this myth has uh, defined constitutionalism as with the two indicators of constitutionalism as i mentioned earlier as well constitutionalism may be seen as a political state of being rather than a set of rules however there must be laws to preserve civil rights and regulations that ensure government accountability and it is important to highlight this and delineate and restrict the executives and the ju judiciary's spheres of authority and these rules must give real guarantees that are not only on paper now there are many definitions of constitutionalism given by many scholars and also supreme court of canada like for example james madison his idea of constitutionalism is that it is connected to the doctrine of restraint government and by Supreme Court of Canada, um, they say that constitutionalism mandates that every action a government takes must be done in accordance with the constitution's provisions, as I mentioned earlier, much earlier in the slide before. And W. Wallace Shaw um, mentioned that constitutionalism is a system of rules or guidelines used to establish, develop, and administer governmental authority. Lastly, Gerhard Kasper mentioned that constitutionalism has both descriptive and prescriptive meanings, including the characteristic of government as fundamental elements of the constitution. Lastly, to conclude, what is constitutionalism? It is, we can say that it is an instrument of limitation, and it is the idea that the government's size, scope, and power must be limited by law. And it is the practice of upholding an existing constitution that we have, and its guiding ideas. And it's to prioritize the freedom of the common man over the authority of the state. Assalamualaikum, my name is Masha and now we will be moving on to the characteristics of constitutionalism. Before we start, I have to, I have to remind you that these are not the only concepts or features under constitutionalism. As said beforehand by my group mate, there are many definitions to constitutionalism and with those variety of definitions, there are a few interpretations on how many concepts fall under constitutionalism. Some would say six, some would say twelve. So in this, for this presentation, we'll be outlining only four, which are common between all of the definitions that we found. So the first one is respect for law. Respect for law or rule of law, those are very similar, um, is well Beforehand, uh, constitutionalism is, at its very core is a concept where the people are loyal to the law, especially the constitution. So the people of the federation must uh, accept the limitations to their freedom and rights. And 
the government also must exercise only the power conferred to them by the law and must not exceed its limit. So um, this concept is then because due to avoid abuse of powers by individuals or organizations and to maintain peace and order between the governors, which is the, gov the government, the three branches of the government, and the government, which is the people of the state. Um, the next uh, concept is responsible government. Um, it is a very straightforward concept, which is the accountability of the government to be answerable for the actions they have taken. So it is where the government is not able to dictate as they like and be exempted from its consequences. So the authorities, should, so the authorities, the government, the people in power, should administer their power with the greater good and the welfare of people in mind. Why? Because the government is a, a responsible government is a notion where the government serves the people and not the other way around. So. The next concept will be judicial independence or independent judiciary. So it, as we know, there are three branches of the government. The judiciary is executive and the legislative. This, con uh, this notion um, provides that the judiciary have to be separated from the other arms of the government. It gives the judges free reign over making decisions without the pressure or worries about their relationship with other bodies because they are free to make whatever decisions they and how they interpret the law. Um, the judiciary should not be subject to undue influence from the executive or the legislative branches of the government or any partisan or private interest businesses, etc. So it allows for fairer judgment, it allows for more precise and accurate judgment by the judiciary. The last um, concept we will be discussing today is free and fair election, which is a democratic um, idea where it is often associated with constitutionalism. Uh, it is the exercise of political freedom and unbiased procedures leading up to the election, uh, uh, where a fair count of eligible voters is then. So uh, it is a freedom of the citizens to, of a state to decide and choose who should represent them and the country. And it is, is the acceptance of the results of the election by all parties that participated in it. However, it should be noted, even though this concept is often related to constitutionalism, it does not always equal to it. To illustrate, if the winning party exercises tyranny or ignores the features of constitutionalism, then the concept will not be able to reign and therefore the, the state will not be able to practice constitutionalism. So even though on the surface the notion seems very fitting with constitutionalism, it is only as so to an extent depending on the popular government, which is the winning party, so values and morals and what they stand for. So now I'll, we, I will be passing to my groupmate to talk about the relevant positions in the federal constitution. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Anissa Pifah Binti Zarin Zin and I will be presenting on the relevant provisions in the federal constitution that relate to constitutionalism. Constitutionalism is a broad and abstract concept. Therefore, how do we assess or measure whether constitutionalism exists? Or how much does a nation adhere to constitutionalism? So here are five critical questions raised by legal scholar Andrew Harding uh, based on Stanley De Smith's definition of constitutionalism. By asking these five questions, it is easier for us to see whether a country practices these five core values of constitutionalism. The first question to be asked is whether elections are free and fair. In the federal constitution, there are no provisions on how elections are to be conducted. The federal constitution only goes as far as setting up an election commission and giving the prime minister the power to request for the, uh, for the dissolution of the parliament to the young deeper Tuan Agung. However, there are other laws enacted to regulate the affair of elections, such as the Elections Act 1958 and Election Offences Act 1954. That being said, we will assess this question by looking at how elections have been conducted in the past. Generally, elections in Malaysia have thus far been peaceful and have thus far not been followed by periods of violence or riots. The transition or transfer of power from one administration to another has... Uh, so far, I had no problems. Perhaps there are conflicts behind the scenes, but that is not for us to discuss. However, there are some points raised to contend this claim that elections in Malaysia are free and fair. One such argument is that the government owns a, por a portion of the media in the country and can and has utilized these platforms to influence the average voter to vote in their favour. However, we would, like, we would like to point out a different view. The 2018 and 2022 general elections have shown that voters are free to choose who they want as their representatives and as their government of the day. What makes the 2018 general election so significant in particular is that the ruling party of 60 years was voted out and in came a different administration. This shows that democracy was successfully at play. Therefore, um, furthermore, 
voters are not forced or coerced to go out and vote. This can be seen by the percentage of the of total voter turnout. In the most recent election in 2022, the percentage was 73.89%. Had voters been forced to vote, the percentage would probably be higher. The second question to be asked is whether governments are constituted by the law or vice versa. Basically, according to Andrew Harding, this is essentially to determine whether the law determines key governmental uh, appointments or do they, do they decide the matter themselves. In the constitution, it is quite clear that these positions are constituted by the law. Some examples would be the appointment of the prime minister in Article 43, Clause 2, Paragraph A, and the election of the speaker and deputy speakers of the Dewaraya in Article 57. Therefore, it can be said that the government is subject to the rule of law and must adhere to how the law, or more specifically the federal constitution, constitutes how the government is formed. The third question is whether governments are accountable to the legislature or vice versa. This is also quite clear in the constitution. Article 43, Clause 3 and Section 2, Subsection 5 of the 8th Schedule in particular demands collective responsibility from the federal and state executives to their respective legislatures, as you can see here. However, there are no elaborations made on what this collective responsibility entails. So in practice, ministers uh, are asked questions in parliament and parliamentary committees that have been set up for various matters have also been vocal in calling out the government on critical issues. However, there has been a recent and worrying trend of speakers turning down motions submitted by the MPs. The most recent case being when the current Speaker of the House, as pictured, rejected to hear more MPs' motion to discuss on the government's plans to handle the recent flood issue. This can be a threat to constitutionalism, and if this trend persists, the government's accountability to the legislature may be significantly hindered. So the fourth question is whether the judiciary is independent. There are several safeguards provided by the federal constitution and other enacted laws to ensure and allow the judiciary to maintain their independence. Some examples of these safeguards are remuneration under Article 125, Clause 6 and 7, as you can see here, and also Article 127 and Section 77 of the Penal Code regarding judicial immunity. Section 77 of the Penal Code in particular gives judges immunity from criminal liability when they are acting in their judicial capacity. Therefore, we can say that by having these uh, safeguards, judges do not have to rely on or resort to external sources to gain income and do not have to fear repercussions when making judicial decisions. This way, there are no factors influencing their decisions and everyone can be assured that only points of law and public interests are taken into consideration. So last but not least, the fifth question to be asked is whether civil liberties are exercisable in practice. This is perhaps a slightly more sensitive uh, question. As, the, as to answer this question, the manner of which human rights are treated in the country are take, um, have to be taken into consideration. However, by looking at the federal constitution, certain basic fundamental liberties are guaranteed to all living in the country. Of course, with several exceptions and limitations as seen in part two. Some of these fundamental liberties guaranteed are personal liberty under Article 5, equality under Article 8, and freedom of speech, assembly, and association under Article 10. In terms of guaranteeing human rights, human rights activist groups may not say that Malaysia has the best track record. However, there is a solution for people who feel that their guaranteed rights have been infringed, and this is why bringing the matter to the courts to decide. However, in terms of the exercisability of these civil liberties in practice, you can say that yes, generally they are exercisable. It all ultimately depends on how the government enforces and limits these liberties, which um, at times may be seen as oppressive. My name is Sarah, and now I will be explaining the relevant cases that we have chosen in relation to the constitutionalism. So the first case um, is the incident of the judicial crisis 1988, where uh, in 1988, it has started with the election of the president of the AMNO party and had ended with the suspension and removal of the Lord President Tun Sari Abbas uh, at the time, along with uh, several judges. So what had happened uh, in the background of the in this incident was that um, uh, the Prime Minister at that time, Dr. Sri Dr. Mahade, was upset with the judiciary's increasing independence. So he had a table, a bill in the parliament to amend articles 121 and 145 of the federal constitution. And the bill had sought to divest the courts of the judicial power of the federation, giving them only such powers as parliament granted them. And the Attorney General was also empowered to determine venues for cases. So um, the Lord President at that time made a statement defending the judiciary's autonomy and he also made a conf confidential letter to the YDPA and this is because um, the Prime Minister at that time had uh, criticised the judiciary not only outside of the parliament but also inside of the parliament. So the YDPA at that time, who was the Sultan of Johor, um, 
uh, told his disapproval of the letter for, uh, to Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad. And uh, the Prime Minister met with the Lord President, uh, which is Tun Sali Abbas, and told him to step down under the order of the YDPA. And um, the, a tribunal was um, set and five days later, the, all the judges, five judges, including the Lord President, was um, removed. So, uh, bringing this issue, so how does this affect the concept of constitutionalism and relates to the independence of judiciary? So, as, as, as explained by my, my group member earlier, uh, independence of judiciary is uh, one of the core uh, elements of constitutionalism. And bringing this issue in our present time, the removal of Tunsali Abbas during the judicial crisis had deeply affected the judiciary body. And from the summary of what ha happened above, it is clear that the removal of the judges had illustrated how the executive has interfered with the independence of judiciary. And um, the executive cannot be interfering with the judiciary as prescribed in the federal constitution. Um, even though Dr. Mahadeh had denied his responsibility for the removal of Tunsali Abbas and instead pointed fingers to the Sultan of Johor, um, it does not cover the fact that he had also interfered in the removal of the judges. So, in conclusion, independence of judiciary is crucial to ensure the effectiveness of the implementation of constitutionalism in Malaysia. And the judicial crisis 1988 had uh, portrayed how the judiciary has lost its independence or weakened its independence and how the executive somewhat has an authority to the works of the judiciary. And under judicial independence, it gives the judges free reign over making decisions without the pressure or influence about their relationship with other bodies. To recover from this incident, the judiciary must be vigilant against the interference from other bodies. Other branches of government must abide by the limitations provided, and each of them must maintain and safeguard the independence of judiciary for the future of our nation and government. The next case is the case of public prosecutor against Mama Ismail in 1984 in relation to the rule of law, which is also one of the core elements of constitutionalism. So in this case, the accused was charged for an offence of trafficking in uh, uh, dangerous drugs, uh, which is against the Section 39B, Section 1 of the Dangerous Drugs Act. And the accused was found guilty by the court. However, on the day of the accused was found guilty, um, the provision was amended to provide mandatory sentence of death upon conviction. But before the amendment, the court had the option of sentencing the accused to death or imprisonment for life. Um, so the public prosecutor had suggested to the court for sentencing the accused with the enhanced penalty. However, the court refused the request as the court held that the amendment could not be applied to the instant case as it was only enacted after the offence was committed. Um, Article 7 and uh, Clause 1 of the Federal Constitution states that no person shall be punished for an act or a mission which was not punishable by law when it was done or made, and no person shall suffer greater punishment for an offence that will, than was prescribed by law at the time it was committed. So this shows that the decision of the of the court was in line with the Article 7, Clause 1 of the Federal Constitution. So, in relation to the rule of law, Dicey has stated in his first postulate that the rule of law requires that no one be punished except for a conduct which represents a clear breach of law. And this will imply that all laws must be open, clear, and prospective in nature. The court must adhere to the provisions provided and not go beyond what is prescribed. And the, the, the judiciary, including all branches of government, must exercise only the power conferred to them by the law and must not exceed its limits. To conclude, the case uh, mentioned illustrates the positive implementation of the concept of uh, constitutionalism, specifically in the branch of the judiciary. It is important for the government to respect the law. And fortunately, in Malaysia, our written constitution, um, the doctrine of rule of law is still regarded as well as recognized and accorded with respect. This will strengthen and also highlight the characteristics of constitutionalism in Malaysia and how it is apparent in our system of governments. In conclusion, this paper illustrated the many definitions and characteristics of constitutionalism and following that had referred to the federal constitution and Malaysian cases improving the existence of constitutionalism in the Malaysian context. So we have come to the conclusion that the Malaysian federal constitution has exhaustively demonstrated the concept of constitutionalism by virtue of the existing, art existing articles that we have laid out beforehand in this presentation. Furthermore, um, the concept of constitutionalism has been solidified by the characteristics of those ideas, the ideas of constitutionalism in cases and events that had taken place in the Federation. So in answering the main question of 
our, our presentation, which is where does the federal constitution incorporate constitu constitutionalism? We believe that yes, the constitution of Malaysia as of right now does practice the idea of constitutionalism based on the upper evidence that we have laid upon beforehand in this presentation. So we conclude our presentation. Thank you so much um, for watching. Have a good day. Bye bye.